We didn't talk about chilled beams, and this is this picture here is why we do chilled beams. Um, basically, the heat capacity of those two bags of air uh, can be carried by this thimble full of water. So you move a lot more heat in a smaller volume or cooling. Um, and so the chilled beam, what we do is there's a certain amount of primary air that comes out, and we can talk about it more when we get down there and you can see it. But the primary air comes in, that's your outside air, but it induces more air through that coil that can heat and cool the room. So you're separating ventilation loads from your internal loads. And then, again, that's a big one. And then the other thing that we do, be, that amount of air would be that size duct, you know, it's a 20-inch duct and a three-quarter horsepower fan. We can do the same amount of energy through a one-inch tube, and it's only one-tenth horsepower. So it's a lot more, less energy. And then we, as a design firm, also size our duct at a lower flow rate. So industry standard is 0.08 to 1.0, excuse me, 0.08 to 0.1 feet per 100 feet of static pressure. We designed a 0.05. And that lower static pressure drop has a, it's a, like a square root or a cubed root rule to it. So your energy falls tremendously just by reducing that horsepower requirement. And is that due to friction in the ducting? Or? Correct. Yeah, because as that air is going down, it's got a, it's basically pushing on the sides of the duct. So the bigger volume, there's less pushing that the air has to do to be able to get down the duct. And the same thing goes for water. So we size at a slower uh, velocity in the piping. Again, now that comes back to lower energy requirements. And then they use the 30% fly ash. Did they talk to you about that? A little bit, not too much. Yeah, so most mixtures are like a 5% fly ash. And so basically when they burn coal and whatnot, the, the ash that comes out of that is called coal ash. You can add that to a cement mix, and so it reduces the amount of cement you need. 5% uh, people used, and we said, well, why can't we go 30%? And they said, mm, we'll see. Um, and it actually, it worked. The problem it does is it retards the curing time. Okay. So instead of like a 50 day cure time, I think it ended up being like 90 day, hmm. which made people really nervous because they'd go back and do a test. And oh gosh, we're still not there, but it's getting better. So we'll wait, we'll wait a little bit more. And so I was a little bit nervous. The other thing is, is there's a kind of a, a swirl of color in there. Mm -hmm. And that's the cement's kind of light in color and the fly ash is dark in color, and trying to get that to mix evenly is very hard to do. But it actually ends up with a nice veneer to it. So. And then the other thing you were talking about, what would change differently? Mm -hmm. Lighting would be a big issue. So uh, the project I'm working on now, six months ago, we were thinking a mix of fluorescent and LED. Mm -hmm. We just changed everything to LED because the price of LED fixtures has come down so much mm -hmm. and the watts per square foot are phenomenal that yeah. there's almost no reason not to go LED. Plus the new Title 24 mm -hmm. is driving you to do that because you need multiple levels of dimming right. uh, and a fluorescent would be very expensive to do that. Hmm. So, so you get a lot more controllability with the LEDs. And and a lower wattage consumption, so That's great. your lighting energy would go down more. Is there less heat coming off of LEDs versus fluorescents <coughs> as well? Yes. Oh, so it is really a win-win-win win, win scenario. Yeah, exactly. That's so. great. In a, a lab system, you need a fully redundant system. Uh, and so here we have 70% redundancy built in to the air handler. The face velocity across the coil typically is designed at 500 feet per minute. We design these units at 250 feet per minute. So there's less pressure drops, so therefore there's less horsepower. That means your fan doesn't have to spin as hard. So there's less fan noise. So you don't have to put the sound attenuator in. <laughs> you don't have to put the sound attenuator in. So you can take that pressure drop out of the system also. So it just starts cascading into other savings. But this is basically 100% outside air, delivers air up, and then it runs along the north side of the office or the lab wall um, out to the labs. And then the exhaust comes back to this plenum here. And this plenum is actually split 
in two, the upper part has a heat recovery coil. Um, and so if there's times where the outside air temperature are advantageous, we can actually capture the heat off of that and pre-cool or pre-heat our out incoming outside air, which knocks those loads down. When it's not advantageous, we don't want to pay the static penalty, so we have a bypass damper on the bottom half. And that way we don't pay the static and bypass. And then the same redundancy that's built into the air handlers we have in the exhaust fans that are around the corner. Splitting the plenum above the lab was it specifically so you could isolate that heat recovery system? Right, because there's you know 0.3 to 0.5 inches of static pressure across there, and we also have a filter there. So the combination of the two, we don't want to pay that static penalty if we're not using the heat recovery. Right. Okay. So to have that air still pass through, even if it's not using the system, you would pay the penalty. Okay. So by having the bypass, we go right around it with very little pressure drop out to the fan. That's great. So this is our primary source of cooling in the building. This is our, our cooling towers. So the intent would be to run these at night, charge the chilled water, the thermal storage tanks down below, down to ideally as low as 40 degrees in the summertime, and then they'll be able to use that water during the daytime for cooling. And so if they can get the tank all the way down, this is all that needs to operate, and again, low water usage because we're using it during night. The plume of heat coming off and water vapor coming off will be a lot less than you would normally. If this doesn't work or we don't have enough capacity inside here. This is the next level of cooling. It's a multi-stack water-to-water uh, heat pump. So we get chill water off one side that can then go and again charge the tanks. The other side um, is the heat that goes to the hot side of the tank. Uh, the nice thing about this, it's two 80-ton chillers, but there's two 40-ton compressors in each, so you get multiple stages by stepping up in 40-ton 40 40 increments. Um, so you don't have to run the whole thing at once. Right. You stage that. Stage it up as we need, and therefore not increase the demand or that load. So when we're running the, the cooling towers for cooling, because that's an open loop system, open loop meaning exposed to the environment, it picks up dust and pollen and things like that. We don't want that in the chill water system. So we run it through this heat exchanger. So on one side is condenser water, the other side is the building chill water system that goes to the, uh, to the thermal storage tank. Oh, great. So this is an open loop system and then there's a heat exchange through here that, that clean water then goes down into the storage. Right, and that way this is a closed loop so it's not exposed to the environment. So once it's treated, we're done. Okay. This is our heating, our sec supplemental heating source. So when those chillers run, we're picking up hot water and we're running, um, we use that water as the condenser water for the water to water heat pumps for heat. If there isn't enough capacity for that, we have this air to water heat pump that we pick up the hot side as water and basically reject cooling into the atmosphere. Uh, and that was actually one of the technical challenges on this building. Uh, we had cooling nailed, not a problem. It was actually trying to make sure we had heating covered because there is, if you get three or four or five cold days in a row, you may not be able to build up enough heat within the thermal storage tank. So we put this in just to make sure it could run. So this should only run four or five hours a month during the, the winter time. And it was just to carry that little bit of load. So when there are times that the rejected heat from the refrigerator system or any of the other systems aren't enough, this is when this Exactly, exactly. Okay. How long do you keep water in the thermal storage tank? How long? How hot? How hot? We allow it to go up to, it goes from 40 to 58. Oh, okay. So then we use that 58 degree water on the heating hot water system. Oh, okay. This is the inverter for the PV system, or one of the inverters. We have a smaller one outside too for the areas that are shaded by the stacks. But this is the main inverter. So the photovoltaics generate DC power 
and the building uses alternating current. So uh, this is the inverter that converts that DC power to AC power, and then the panels that distribute it. So that would be another thing, you know, five years down the road or the next building that comes up, there's a lot more work being done on DC distribution. So everywhere from um, ceiling grids that act as a DC distribution system. So when you set your light in, it picks up its power from the actual T-bar grid and you don't actually have to wire them. Uh, any other low voltage system in there, you could just plug in, transformer, connect right to that grid. So you'd save all that wiring cost and then everything's DC. So your DC from your PV wouldn't have to go through the inverter to run that. So you could make this very small and pick up just the AC current you need to run pumps. Everything else could be DC. And so what is the conversion factor on an inverter like this system? Excellent question for an electrical engineer. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> So the pumps, just because they're cycling, you need alternating current? Is that the, I, is that I think they do make DC right? pumps, oh, DC okay. motors. I just don't know how prevalent they are and how efficient they are. So my assumption is that they would need AC current for that. So now we're in the, the catwalk area that's above the lab space. And the purpose of this is to basically separate the maintenance staff from the laboratory scientists. So up here we have all the valves, all the controls that they may need to get to. So if they need to change a valve, they're not bringing a ladder into the lab, popping a ceiling tile, having dust fall down onto their bench and all their work. They can come up here, they can change this actuator, they can change a uh, uh, sensor, although I didn't point to a sensor. Mm. Um, you know, they can change all that. We have our electrical panels are also up here. Uh, don't know if they're open. So all the circuits that feed that lab are in these panels. Uh, we do provide spares. So if they want to run a new piece of equipment and they need new power, they can actually put the breaker in, they can run the conduit, they can put it right above where they need it to be without being in the occupied space, come in at night, drop it down the wall, hook it up and be done. So it has very little uh, impact to the user groups, which is nice. And then above you, find a good spot, we have our air terminals. So these are the valves that are supplying and exhausting air into and out of the labs. And again, the, the actuator and controllers are right here. So the maintenance guy can do his work there. Um, and that serves basically everything over the catwalk, serves the south side of the lab. On the north side of the lab, what we did is we routed it around so it again is accessible right off the catwalk. So making it easy, that's a, a key piece of the design. If you put a valve or sensor in a place that the maintenance guy can't get to it, when it breaks, it doesn't get replaced. And then without that control, you start losing energy efficiency in the system. So highly important to make sure that Everything the maintenance guy needs to get to, they can get to easily and not risk their health. So on this side is all the hydronic systems, and on this side is the electrical systems, and the air is kind of mixed in between. Yeah. So above us, or is it just that section that has the economizer in it? So all the exhaust air mm -hmm. runs along that large duct on the back. Oh, okay. And then above it, you can see the supply from the air handler. Ah. That's our distribution trunk. So that trunk runs down and then goes into that heat recovery plenum. Oh, okay. So that's just, it's not the full extra story. No. That's just that unit. That's right just there. that unit. Right. Okay. And since that's exhaust, it's not losing too much efficiency, not being insulated. Correct. Well, and it's basically at room air temperature, okay. right? So for Title 24, right. we need to insulate the supplies, but the exhausts don't need to be. Right. How hard is it from a Title 24 standpoint to meet the new kind of leakage rate? Um, or did you have to do Title 24 2013 or? The we were in the older version, okay. so this went to permit, so it's 14, 12, I think we're under the 2009 Title 24, oh, okay. 2010. 
2010? I think it's somewhere around there is, I think in 11 is when we finally went to permit okay. and the two years to build it, now we're here. I would, I'd want to check those dates. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the new Title 24 actually from a, a ceiling requirement really isn't hard for the engineer mm -hmm. because we just say you hit this requirement. It's actually more on the contractor side to make sure that it's properly sealed. Mm -hmm. And in a laboratory setting, because this air is so expensive, we always specify the highest sealant and connection possible mm -hmm. um, because that air is so expensive and it's once through typically, we don't want it going into the ceiling space. Mm -hmm. So for labs, it's not a big deal. And for contractors who do lab work, it's not a big issue. Yeah, it's a standard practice. Yeah, the biggest issue with the new Title 24 is actually uh, on the lighting side, um, having multiple levels of dimming being needed uh, basically is forcing people into the LED light fixture world. And because of that, we've just seen the price for LED fixtures come tumbling down, so it's great. That is great. Yeah. I've also heard that there's a lot having to do with plug load and occupant sensors yep. Yep. and having workstations being individually controlled as yep. well. That's yeah. Good. About 10 years ago, I had actually sat down with, uh, I think it was the Herman Miller rep, and I said, I want a workstation and I want an occupancy sensor that's gonna turn off half the plugs and the task lines. And he said, there's no way I could do that. That's mm. just crazy. And I said, why not? You're already pre-wiring in. Just put an occupancy sensor in. And he goes, there'll be too much money. People don't wanna pay for that. And here we are, you know, 10 years later, and now you have to have it. Mm. You know, you have to be able to turn the plug lids off. So it's nice to see people moving that direction. Uh, kinda hard to see, but that, and I'm colorblind, so I'm not sure, it's like a green cable. Uh -huh. yep. Okay. Yay, got it right. <laughs> That's the air acuity tubes. Um, so it's a it's specially designed tube. It basically has a solid or a hollow core on the inside, and then it has uh, wiring on the outside, I think it is. And basically, we call those sniffer tubes. And so they're mounted in the general exhaust duct. And this is part of the air acuity system. So basically, it takes a sample of air and then it runs back in the panels on the other side of the wall. I can show you in a bit. And then analyzes that sample. And if it detects high levels of VOC or if there's a uh, high level of particulate, it thinks that there's an event going on. It'll automatically raise the air change rate in that lab suite to air eight air changes. It'll also send an alarm to the um, facility operator so that they know there's an event and they can go down and see if there's actually a spill or did someone just make a mistake and do something on the bench that was supposed to be in the hood in the line. So ideally it never operates because they have good lab practices going on down there, but just in case. It, it, and EHS likes it because it gives them a, a level of assurance that if something were to happen, there is a increase in ventilation rate. So these are the, the cute heat exchangers. Uh, this is the industrial hot water and then this is the domestic hot water. Um, and basically we take the hot water that's being rejected off our system to create heating hot water. Some of that comes through here. Uh, proper sanitiz you know, separation double wall heat exchanger set up. So that's how we generate the industrial hot water that goes to the lab space and then the domestic hot water that goes out to the laboratories and the showers that's downstairs. And so that they have capacity, we have these storage tanks. So this one here is for the industrial water. This one's here for the domestic water. And the reason why the domestic's actually larger is actually because of the showers downstairs. Um, most people, you know, they wash their hands, it's a few seconds, off they go. People tend to sit in the shower, especially after surfing, you gotta get all the sand off you and whatnot. So, tank's a little bit larger, but the intent is, is we maintain the tanks at 120 degrees, and then the water is distributed out to the spaces. So industrial has more steady flow, so you need a smaller tank. Right. Because that's at one point of demand. Whenever Suddenly, boom, it's a shower. They, okay. need the, they need the capacity, exactly. And how many gallons would this larger tank be? 
don't worry about that. Kind I'm of guessing thing. that's 500. Oh, okay. So I'm going to guess that's 750. Okay. Would be my guess, but we can go look and verify that. The lab does require compressed air, so we do have an air compressor, and again, it's redundant. And of course, it came on while we're trying to talk. <laughs> so there's multiple compressors in here, so if one fails, they can still get compressed air in the system. They are able to remove the compressor or the filter and put it back in. And that's just for their lab equipment? Yes. Okay.